Okay, well, if you've made it this far, everybody, then, because um, it's, it, it's been a long day, so um, this is the final discussion of the day. So um, well done for making it this far. You must uh, be very interested in what we're going to say, so we're going to make it um, as fabulous as possible. And, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that I've got such a stellar panel joining me. Um, first of all, on the stage here, let me introduce Anna Maria Duchak Sigesten, who is Associate Professor of Strategic Communication and European Studies at Lund University in Sweden. Uh, Yegor Gordeev is a presenter and a producer at One Plus One Media in Ukraine. And uh, Andres Arato is the director and CEO of Hungary's Club Radio. Um, and joining me uh, on screen is uh, Susanna Papazoski, who, um, who is from the National Democratic Institute, and Teresa Ribeiro from the OSCE, representative on f freedom of the, the media. Um, quick introduction, what we're, we're, we're talking about, um, propaganda, misinformation, fake news, media freedom, all of these things, you know, all of these things which have a potential to polarize public opinion, to promote violent extremism, hate speech, and ultimately undermine democracy. Um, neither, you know, neither, none of these things are new. You know, all of these things have existed for, you know, a very, very long time. The problem that we face today, unfortunately, is that, you know, because of all the channels that we have, they can be amplified so quickly and so widely. Um, just a, a, a quick fact, which I actually read a couple of days ago. The Council of Europe recently released data suggesting that two-thirds of EU citizens uh, report seeing a fake news story at least once a week. And that's the fake news that we can, that they can recognize. You know, if we actually include the fake news that they can't recognize because they don't realize it's fake, then the percentage would, uh, would actually be even higher. Um, but as I mentioned, this is not just about fake news and propaganda. It's also about media freedom. Um, and in some countries of emerging Europe, unfortunately, reporting the news is not as easy as uh, it, it, it should be. And that's, um, that's probably why I'm going to actually um, start with you, Andres, because I think it would be instructive if you could tell us a little bit about the, the recent experience of Club Radio in, in, in Hungary and the problems that uh, you've been facing. Well, is it working? It's working. <coughs> Good. Well, after a, a refreshing and easy day, as it was today, you, we have now a light pro, uh, topic for, for the evening. Um, so, f as an introduction, I could uh, stop myself after one, one and a half hours. If I want I'll to try one and present, a half minutes, but <laughs> okay. If I want to present the whole uh, stuff, uh, I must put the question: What do you do if you want to establish an autark? Um, dictatorship-like society. First of all, you want to control the information. What do you need uh, for controlling uh, the information? Your first step must be uh, to take the power over the, the entire media. The first element of taking over the power uh, of the entire media is to take away their making of living, to dominate uh, the advertising market, the communication market. This was recognized by the actual Hungarian government uh, early enough. For example, Club Radio, which is still now existing, just to let you stay optimistic, uh, it, uh, its income uh, went a little bit down from about 2 uh, million uh, yearly income to about 100,000. And still it That's is disastrous. at that That's level. So this, uh, we will return if you, there will be any, any question about it. How did you survive? The second one, uh, when you are already dominating in the media and the Fidesz government uh, do dominate so uh, entirely, one may say there are only just a few independent medias in, in Hungary. But if it's not enough, then come, uh, do come the institutional uh, methods. 
uh, you must create the authority, a one-party authority, for example, the Media Council, which is absolutely dominating in the Hungarian media, dominating over the public media, which is now a propaganda media. But this is the body which gives the licenses, which takes away the licenses, and Club Radio was deprived from it li its license. You can may put the question, how did we survive? Later on, I probably I, I will answer this question. So um, I, I, uh, I read your, your questions or your topics, and uh, the evening could be very short because I can answer that I don't have the answer for this question. I have answers for the individuals, the consumers of the news, that you must take all the opportunity to have different sources for your personal information. Meanwhile, the most of the society doesn't have any need for information. And just uh, let me finish uh, this uh, short introduction with a small anecdote. Uh, before the elections in April in Hungary, I gave an interview to a Spanish reporter, and uh, she put me the question, how is that uh, Orban doesn't uh, give any, uh, any public publicity, doesn't make any, uh, uh, any process for winning? Well, at first moment, I didn't understand the question, but uh, later on the, uh, um, <clears throat> the stone uh, was uh, falling down. So uh, this lady saw the billboards all around in the country, and on the billboards there were only two faces, Gyu Chan, who is the leader of, uh, of a lefty uh, party, and Mark Izai, who was the, uh, the, uh, the one who might have been the prime minister uh, offered by the opposition. And this was shown by this uh, journalist from Spain, but she, not knowing uh, Hungarian, she did not rec recognize the text. The text was the following. They are dangerous out of them from our uh, from our society, simplifying the. So that's how uh, um, you can have your information if you are not interested deeply. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And you know, I, I am going to come back at the end, and I am going to ask you how you uh, how you managed to to survive. Um, Yego, I'm going to come to you next. Um, just tell us a bit about the current situation in Ukraine. I mean, you know, journalists, you're not just having to report on a terrible war but you're kind of doing two jobs because you're also having to counter Russian propaganda. I mean, how, how are you coping at the moment? How, how? Mm, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, Greg, I'm the person, I'm a journalist in Ukraine who reported uh, about the start of the great escalation. To my regret or not, I don't know. It's my fate. I will live with it. Uh, and that's why in the studio, it was early morning, you know, this day very good. I stayed in the studio, in my studio, uh, before the morning show, and I understood clearly in that time that we, I mean Ukrainian and maybe European people in European Union, had lost informational hybrid war against Russia at that time. Uh, because we were at that point, we now at this point. I, um, I try to understand what, why, uh, we and you mean Ukraine and uh, European people uh, were at crossroads um, approximately 20 years ago uh, when this propaganda started, yeah, uh, in light form, then harder, harder, and that on, etc. We um, made a choice. We tried to create uh, some business from media. Uh, it's impossible for Ukraine because there is people inhabited in Ukraine. There is people who. Uh, doesn't pay uh, for content. It's a normal and it's evolutional process. But before the great escalation, let's imagine before the great escalation, all the huge TV channel and holdings became business, really business. Uh, you know about income in TV, you know about in Indrado as well, you know uh, about commercial breaks and you know about uh, some uh, direct uh, Mm, direct payment that uh, don't exist in Ukraine, yeah? So we create some model for our prosperity as we understood it and live in some mm, good vibes, yeah? But um, I agree with you that maybe it's one of their maybe basis of their um, 
that area that um, may be very effective against propaganda, but not in our area. And maybe the next way, it's in your area. In your, when I say in your area, I mean Hungary, I mean any countries, I think. So um, our normal evolutional model uh, wasn't very useful uh, since uh, February 24th. Uh, and now maybe I have some propositions. I don't know how to say it correct, really. Because uh, now all European... Um, TV channels and all European, I mean, for foreign, uh, for foreign audience, um, they uh, create some uh, context very formally against propaganda. Propaganda is very expensive. Contra propaganda is very expensive as well. We, uh, for us, for Ukraine, it's too late. For you, it's not too late. But you can create now a new, uh, a new space, a new informational space, not uh, um, give some... Um, truth information after fail, one by one, one by one, one by one, it's, um, it doesn't work. Because fail, it's um, not very, um, very, um, it's a system of fails, yeah, it works like a system, it's a new religion. Uh, and um, it's like a devil that uh, is very impressive and millions of people eat it. And then when you, uh, then you uh, give um, another truth information, and that may be source, it's no matter. Uh, only half of their millions hear it, watch it. So it's not very effective. Uh, only one way, I think, um, maybe we can do it as well. Um, we need to create some uh, universe like uh, MTV, like CNN, made in the United States of America. It's some world, new religion, that answers on all questions. It's uh, new words of uh, our understandings, our meanings. When I say our, I mean our Ukrainians and Europeans. We should understand what about we all together. Now all these historical events now uh, not far from uh, our place is uh, actual, yes, that's why it's good days to understand what about um, every one of us, our spaces, and make some universe with this. Uh, maybe it's a um, goal for um, Yevron use, I don't know. But uh, as we see, as we understood, as we feel, uh, now it's a good chance to do it. Um, well, if, if, sorry if, for if advice. <laughs> sorry for advices. Maybe it's like here, uh, you hear like advices, but I don't know how to say it in another way. If um, if I can come to you, Anna Maria, um, I want to. You, you said to me last week when we were, you know, discussing this. You said that, um, you know, a lot of the time the purveyors of false news are, you know, governments themselves. You know, we're not talking about troll farms in North Macedonia or wherever it might be. It's actually the governments themselves who are, who are putting this out. And this is particularly relevant, for example, in terms of the Russian Federation propaganda, um, because that's a state uh, enterprise. Um, it's also the case that sometimes politicians who are representing governments can spread false information. And uh, the primary example comes from Donald Trump's uh, office. But um, there are many Donald Trump lookalikes around the world and sometimes even within the emerging Europe region. So. Um, but and I also wanted to emphasize, so on one hand, we have this kind of government propaganda. Uh, Hungary is another example where the government shares falsities about the reality of everyday life or false interpretation uh, of what uh, is the cause of certain frustrations from the people and so on. And there is no counterbalance from a free media to provide this alternative interpretation. Um, and in another, in another situation, we also have a certain reluctance from the citizens, and maybe also going back to what uh, Andras was saying before, to engage with news. Um, to cite another research uh, um, publication recently appeared the Reuters Institute report about the consumption of news across different continents pointed out to a decrease in interest from regular people to read any news about politics, economics, and so on. People, and again, we are not talking about individual countries, but overall as a trend, refused to engage with the news because it made them feel sad, depressed, or because it antagonized families 
it provoked conflicts. The, the news was so polarizing, perhaps that's another way to, to describe it, that people preferred to what I call cats on TikTok. That's, yeah, well, that's, you know. the, the ostrich approach, right? Like, put your head in the sand, and if you don't see the evil, it doesn't happen, or something. Of course, I exaggerate. But there, these are two trends that are very complicated. Uh, on one hand, the government propaganda that has a lot of money invested in it, as uh, you guys were saying before. And on the other hand, a reluctance from the public around the world in democratic and less democratic societies to read the news because the news are problematic. The world in which we live is problematic. And so having these two tendencies, both from the top down and from the bottom up, creates an environment where propaganda or falsities, as you were saying, are, are having a, a propitious terrain to flourish. So that's, that's my personal worry. All, all right, um, Susanna and Teresa are on the screen there. You've, uh, you've been listening patiently. Um, I'm going to come to you uh, first, Teresa. Um, you know, I want to look a bit more about, you know, we've kind of heard the problems and I want to focus a little bit on how we can put them, you know, put them right. You know, how can we start the fight back, as it were? I mean, what's the OSCE's role in all of this? You know, how, how are you trying to make sure that the information that we get is, is, is as accurate as possible? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, it's really a pleasure. It's a, it's a, I'm very sorry not to, to join you, uh, but unfortunately, due to uh, air flight strikes, uh, I couldn't be uh, with you today. Um, you know, uh, let me start by saying, uh, or by giving some information about uh, OSCE. Uh, it's uh, an organization for uh, cooperation, uh, security cooperation, uh, with a very, very specific uh, um, DNA, which is a comprehensive security approach, which means that uh, human rights are embedded in the concept of security. And I think that this is very important. Uh, and uh, because, uh, you know, peace and human security democracy are much less likely to engage in war and civil war than autocracies. So this is uh, precisely what I would like to start saying. We are this year celebrating the 25th anniversary uh, of uh, my institution, the representative on freedom of the media, and our slogan, our statement, which is really a statement, is there is no security without media freedom, precisely to underlining um, the, the, what are the linkage between both. And I think this, uh, you know, uh, uh, me and my team, we chose this, uh, this slogan last year, but it couldn't, uh, couldn't be more true uh, than, uh, than it is now. Um, while we are witnessing all these uh, all these uh, developments, and what we witness now in our region, in the OSU region, which is a wide region from uh, Vancouver to Vladivostok, is a clear declining uh, on media freedom, and it's uh, clearly um, uh, a, ten a tendency to uh, autocratic uh, governments that increasingly use misinformation to shape domestic and international opinion in their favor. And of course, they use different, different techniques. Uh, in the case uh, of Hungary, and we had this uh, fantastic uh, uh, testimony from Claude Ryder, it's, 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 uh, in, uh, it, what we see is that it's a systemic and systematic approach to media freedom and freedom of expression. Uh, it's not just, uh, and uh, it's so systemic, it's like an octopus that really, uh, really managed to silence all critical voices. Uh, and so it's what, what, what is left uh, is uh, government mouthpieces, uh, definitely. And this is not, uh, unfortunately, only the case uh, in this particular country, but it's uh, very much uh, the problem that we can witness uh, globally. At the same time, and regarding uh, the war now in Ukraine, we can 
clearly see the links between what happened and what was happening in Russia. We had all these laws uh, tightening uh, uh, the, the, the foreign agent uh, and uh, labeling everyone with foreign agent, making the life for them impossible. Uh, so, and this is linked uh, and creating uh, you know the 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 the, the environment conducive to the acceptance by the public opinion in Russia that this was um, a justified war. So you know this all these things are clearly linked, and it's uh, it's it's very interesting. The other thing I would like very much to refer is that now what we have in Ukraine is journalists, the local ones, and I pay tribute uh, to all these people, together with the international ones. And they, uh, and their work, imagine if they were not there. We couldn't know what is happening on the ground. And at the same time, uh, we couldn't have the evidence of some, uh, of allegedly uh, crimes committed that would be very important in the future for accountability mechanisms and for the courts. So media freedom, freedom of expression are really key. Uh, they, are, they must be put in the center of our democracies. And when we deal with this information, when we deal with fake news, we have to be very careful uh, and not to throw out the baby uh, with, uh, with the water. This, I think, is very, very, very important and we need to be very careful. And this is, I would say, my, <laughs> my main message. Let's use the right instruments uh, let's not forget that uh, freedom of expression um, protects um, propaganda, disinformation, but, but when propaganda, it's propaganda for war, or is propaganda that is uh, uh, to promote uh, hatred, uh, to prom uh, re religious, racial, national, um, uh, hatred, then yes, uh, we have to act. But you know, we have to be, again, my message is let's be very careful in, uh, in um, you know, in dealing, in addressing the enormous challenges that we have ahead of us. We do. There is an information disorder, clearly, infodemics, whatever. Uh, we have quite a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, diagnosis. We, uh, we know the challenges. Let's use the right tools to, uh, to address them. Let's not allow it to be a pretext for silence critical voices. And we know, and unfortunately, in the OSC region, what I see every day is new laws uh, that uh, are uh, presumably uh, wanting to address uh, disinformation and fake news, but in the end, what we'll do is to silence uh, critical voices. So let's be very, very careful when dealing with this problematic, which is a real one. I do not want to diminish it. Uh, and uh, let's use the right instruments. Okay, Thanks thank so you, much. thank you, uh, Teresa. Uh, Susanna, I'm going to come to you. I mean, the, the National Democratic Institute. I know that you're, you know, you're active in quite a lot of the countries that you know Emerging Europe covers across Central and Eastern Europe. Um, you know, I mean, are there any reasons for optimism? You know, I, <laughs> I kind of put you on the spot a little bit there, but you know, is is there a, is there is there any reason at all for for optimism? 
Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this discussion and conversation. We at NDI, we always believe there is a, <laughs> there is a re reason for optimism. We are we are promoters of democracy and democratic institutions, and um, and I think that uh, with the Central Europe Democracy Initiative, we have been working with different actors, with young people, politically active women, uh, local governments, and cities. And I think um, uh, although the situation is not optimistic, uh, and the general trend was already mentioned that we have seen steady democracy decline in the region since 2015. I think um, I think the the recent war in uh, Ukraine was a wake up call uh, to many. Um, probably as an example for optimism, I could mention Slovakia, that was one of the countries that was the most vulnerable to Russian propaganda and disinformation. Um, just to illustrate, it's a country where. In 2020, uh, Putin had approval ratings of 55%. And still in January, uh, so just a month before the outbreak of the war, uh, there were over 40% of the population that blamed NATO and the United States for the escalation of tensions uh, uh, in Ukraine. And after the war, that has changed. And uh, now over 60% of the population. There is, there is some research that was conducted by Globsec in March 2022 that really shows that uh, the recent war was a you know, wake-up call to many. And there is a greater understanding of some of the challenges and, um, and the trend is across the region that uh, more attention should be played, uh, placed on uh, monitoring and um, um, disclosing the, the propaganda. So. I mean, this is just one tiny example, but I think we are seeing, uh, even based on the research we conducted among the young people, uh, that they are much more aware um, of, uh, of the vulnerability of, uh, you know, social media space. They are aware of some state-run propaganda that is uh, not only observed in, in Hungary, but I'm personally based physically in Poland, running our operations in Poland. And you are probably as well aware that we have seen um, um, some attempts to limit uh, the media freedom in Poland. Um, so I think that uh, there is always an opportunity to do more, to be more proactive. Um, and um, I'm glad that through our programming, we are uh, at least able to address some of the existing challenges. Thank you. Um, um Andres, I'm going to ask you next. What do you think the, you know, the, the international community perhaps could do for, you know, an organisation like, like yours? You know, how 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 can we help? You know, what what can we do? Well, just uh, to begin, it does, is it silent? No, okay. for the the masses do hear me in the room. Uh, <clears throat> first, uh, let me answer the the input question. We survived because. Uh, we recognized the situation, I mean the financial situation, uh, by the end of 2009, we saw what was going on and we built up an infrastructure for a donation basis. And it was, of course, something in, in darkness because in a country where there is no tradition for civilian activity, neither for democracy, we could not know what was going on. During the last 12 years, we got about in, if we count in euros, six million euros from our public. That was almost enough for our survival. The, the second one that uh, by the end of 2020, we recognized that our license is going to be deprived. Uh, it was entirely clear and then clear. And then we began to train our public to turn to the internet. And after losing the frequency, uh, we do not have less listeners and less supporters uh, for a radio station. What was your question? Well, uh, <coughs> well, what can we do? What can, what can the international community do? What can organizations, you know, such as the well, OSCE or whoever it might what, be, I mean, how uh, do you yeah, think I, they could no, help? I, you know, I, I catch does it mean placing coaching. pressure on governments? So, or? Uh, I think that uh, European, uh, the European community uh, should find or should have found already uh, methods for f 
financing the rest of the independent media in the countries where there is no uh, media freedom. Just let me mention something emotional that uh, for you. That um, in Hungary, uh, the propaganda media, which is 95% of the whole media, their listeners hear that, uh, well, there was something wrong what Russia has done, but... And they say, but America, but Brussels, and uh, uh, given weapons, and that's why the war is prolonged. The public of the of the of Club Radio and some other uh, rest of the independent media uh, uh, thinks that uh, there was an, a huge aggression, and there is no but. So I think, and this is only one actual problem uh, for for the mankind, and which is very strong today. But there are a lot of uh, problems during there have been during the last uh, 12 years, and it is very very significant. And in a depressed country like Hungary or Poland, uh, <clears throat> the public should get something different from the from the propaganda so support this uh, publicity what we do have in europe i was invited in the european union even 10 years ago when it was entirely visible what was going on the difference is that in 2012 the court uh, the tribunals were yet independent today it is impossible to get uh, a verdict which is which is legal I tried to understand, uh, to answer your question. It is impossible in, in the limitation of time, of course. Uh, no problem. Anna, Anna Maria, I mean... Oh, I just, excuse me. Go on. Just to have something uh, for, for optimism, if I uh, succeeded. Uh, we want I all succeeded. the optimism we can get, so... Okay. Now, uh, we lost our frequency. And here is Club Radio, e even in Brussels, anywhere in the world. So you must never give up. Excuse me. <laughs> Thanks. Anna Maria, um, obviously, you know, you're an educator, you know, you're assistant professor at a university. What is the role of education in this? And, you know, where do we start and how young do we start in, you know, teaching media literacy? You know? I think, uh, obviously, digital literacy and media literacy are the fundamental stepping stone into knowing what is how to identify something that is false from something that is correct and more than anything about a process of critically engaging with the news. But we also know that this is very difficult. Even when you educate and you uh, um, take children from uh, the first grade in school and expose them to this critical thinking, um, it comes against a psychological mechanism of conformity. We, all of us, choose to believe that which fits which our previous beliefs, so news that match our already expressed ideological positions or affiliations or what have you. So it's very difficult, and this is the, the where propaganda can have success. If they feed on some existing um, tendencies in a population, it can be national pride, it can be frustration, it can be uh, conspiracy theories. I'm sure my colleagues also have examples in this in this uh, arena and so on and so forth. But that's where the difficult part comes. You train people, and you uh, they can uh, react appropriately according to these teachings when the news does not affect them personally, but when the news elements directly talk to either their particular situation their national identity, some other identity they may hold, that is where the conflict between truth and falsity um, can be revealed. Uh, I also wanted to comment very briefly, and I really appreciate um, all the comments made before about about how to how to fight or how to support like business the business approach. Uh, how can we sponsor this? It's I think it's a great thing to allow people to um, contribute. At the same time, it's never enough, and I'm sure both of you agree that it's in, insufficient to have this commercial model unless you are the New York Times uh, and you speak English, which is a which is a worldwide language and so on. But if we look at the media systems in general that don't belong to the English language or other major uh, world languages. Most of the time, the private um, initiatives are not sufficient if news is concerned. If entertainment is concerned, that's another business, right? So if we are thinking about commercial television channels that have 
this kind of uh, Robinson Island or so commercial programs, then obviously that's not what I'm meaning. But if we're thinking about professional news commentary, news analysis, uh, information and security, as uh, Teresa was also talking about before, I don't think it's sufficient to rely on a commercial model. And maybe this is the Swedish person in me who comes up and it said that the state or some form of institutional support is necessary in order to provide a, a service that is not commercially attractive to a majority of people, taking what I was saying before. It has to be a state that we trust. That's the problem. <laughs> and this is where the dilemma lies, right? Like, it, how can you build a commercial activity uh, for news when people, first of all, are not interested in the hard news, and two, the state works against you, like basically would like to be, become a supportive of the government. So I see the dilemma, but without some form of external support, I don't think it's is going to be an easy situation in the future either. Um, two, two, two more quick comments um, before we close. Susanna, I just, I just want to come back to you because I know that, um, you know, the a big part of the National Democratic Institute's work is, you know, inclusivity and, you know, especially dealing with, you know, online violence against women, this kind of thing. Um, you know, how do we make sure that the, the, the voices of the unheard are heard? You know, how can we amplify the voices of, you know, women, of, you know, minorities, of whoever it might be? I mean, what are your recommendations from... Um, one of our, you know, approaches is just bringing people together and, and bringing coalitions of different stakeholders, uh, including the institutions and private sector, you know, uh, different uh, communication platforms and, and bring those people together. I mean, in, from our perspective, uh, there are several elements which are incredibly vulnerable or which we should kind of put more attention at. And that's basically the elections. We really believe that uh, more attention should be placed on tackling and addressing uh, online violence against uh, women, especially around the elections, uh, gender disinformation and different use. Um, uh, different text, te tactics that is being used to um, scare women. And we developed a lot of resources and by bringing different stakeholders together, working with political parties, training the candidates, we can empower them to be better prepared to face those challenges. Another one is definitely the elections. You know, it's, it's more important than ever to as well um, look at the uh, disinformation and hate speech, computer propaganda that is um, often driving the electoral campaigns around uh, the elections. We've seen that happening in Hungary, we've seen it in, in many countries, and we are trying to send experts and experts. And when we do election monitoring, make sure that we as well monitor uh, this, um, uh, this space um, uh, during, during the elections. And I should probably mention just one last initiative uh, that is exactly an example uh, of a coalition. It's called uh, Design for Democracy Coalitions, through which NDI and our DC headquarters brought together different, um, uh, different uh, uh, media companies like Twitter, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, alongside other civic and technology uh, partners and drafted democratic principles for the information space. We really believe that uh, we need to preserve the integrity of the information space and we promote uh, throughout those principles values like transparency, privacy, accountability and openness. So by bringing all these stakeholders together, I think really maybe you don't uh, eradicate <laughs> this information, uh, but at least you can contribute to a more democratic and open and transparent um, information space. All right, thanks. Um We've run out of time. We're already over time, but I just uh, want a very, very brief comment um, um, before we close from you, Yegor. Just, just about President Zelensky, you know, and please be brief, but, you know, I mean, here is, you know, we've been talking about, you know, the state's role in media, but here is somebody who, yes, he's got a, an entertainment background, but he has used media very, very effectively, you know, to get his message across. I mean, objectively, from a Ukrainian, I mean, how do you see, you know, the, the job that he's done? 
Briefly, of course, and you know this answer, <laughs> yes. And uh, it, the adding that I want to say to you that uh, propaganda is like a word, universe, it's a package where it, and use may be very effective and commercial. We uh, say um, aesthetic, contra-aesthetic of propaganda. Um, our style of life should be stylish, modern, and a lot of people um, try to touch it. Uh, not, th not that world with uh, hate news, with hate propaganda, this one. Uh, it's very difficult and I think it uh, should be some progressive person or group of personalities that uh, make and create some idea, universe idea or two ideas, three ideas, I don't know. But I think it's uh, only one uh, um, counter variant that will rescue us. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I mean, you know, Good luck, guys. Um, you know, I'm really, uh, really sorry that we run out of time, but um, we are pushed because we've still got a few things to get through. The, the pleasant part of the day, if you like, when we hand out the awards, will be, we'll be coming next after, um, after we've heard from Sir Malcolm Rifkind. So thank you very much. Thank you to Teresa and Susanna for, for joining us. Um, and thank, thank you, you uh, Anna Maria. Thank you, Yegor. And thank you, um, Andres. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.